Buonasera, welcome everyone to this uh, first 2015 event of our digital diplomacy series. Some of you have been here before, we've done quite a number of these. We are very uh, proud of what we do in digital diplomacy and related issues and the things that the embassy does on, uh, on, uh, on the web and with social media. Um, this is our first um, panel discussion in 2015. The very first one took place in October 2012. And since, and since that time, we organized quite a number of these uh, uh, events, many insightful discussions on the road ahead on the g digital diplomacy and actually the digital citizenship. And we hosted a number of experts that uh, you, I'm sure, you know, from you know, Alec Ross to Anne-Marie Slaughter, from David Ignatius to PJ Crowley, and many, many others. So we have been able to create a number of new partnerships that still continue to this day, including with the Digital Diplomacy Coalition, uh, with the Young Professionals on Foreign Policy Network, Women in Foreign Policy Group, Ushahidi, the American Red Cross, and the list goes uh, on. And so our Digital Diplomacy series has become truly an uh, open forum on opportunities, on best practices, on challenges, a platform to discuss the definition of engagement and the role of innovation and technology in our work. We have focused on new trends as well as on the changing nature of power, which I think is a very intriguing element in, its, in itself. Now, as, of today's, as for today's event, the focus will be on digital, sorry, on diplomacy in the participatory age and the role of technology in that context. So I would like to thank in particular John Hudson for leading our discussion today. As you know, John is a senior reporter at Foreign Policy and the co-author of uh, the FP's blog, uh, The Cable. And I would also like to thank all the other great panelists we have today, and they will be properly introduced in a moment. They represent institutions that are leading the way in creating a new space in which citizens can mark, can make their voices heard and can really mark and shape the decision-making processes very often, even in official institutions, and that is something we keep a very close eye on. Uh, from online petitions on uh, change.org to international campaigns uh, via ONE and the UN Foundation, citizens are active participants in the foreign policy process. And let me say, our work as diplomat, as ambassadors, has completely changed, and I really cannot see how we'll be able to, be able to work without the recourse to social media in the way that we do. The State Department is working on many new initiatives as well, like the YALI Network and the Share America Portal. The Embassy, the Italian Embassy, has developed a very deep collaboration with the State Department on these issues, including on the Map Give project to create open map data for humanitarian and development purposes. And that project was successfully translated into Italian in 2014, thanks to the contribution of leading open map experts in Italy. Technology allows for the creation of a more collaborative space in which ideas can be nurtured and citizens, individuals, non-state actors can participate in the process. For instance, in Italy, you may have heard that the Speaker of the Italian House uh, is working on a draft uh, Bill of Rights uh, for the Internet that is currently online for public uh, comments uh, because we want the she wants we want the final draft, the final text to be as inclusive as uh, as participate, participatory as uh, as possible. And frankly, this initiative that the Italian House is uh, is undertaking shows the importance of the role that citizens, individuals, can play in shaping policies, as I said earlier, and this will have an impact on both national policy, politics and on foreign policy. So what is the road ahead on these issues? What are the challenges in this domain? What opportunities exist for diplomacy in this domain? These are some of the questions that we are trying to answer through the digital diplomacy series here at the Embassy and specifically with our panel uh, today. 
Um, I won't be able to stay through the whole event, uh, but I wish you a very fruitful, a very engaging discussion. Thank you again for joining us. John, it's now to you. You have the floor to address these issues and any other that you may wish to address today. Thank you so much. Have a great meeting. Thanks, Mr. Ambassador, uh, for the introduction, and thanks to the Embassy for hosting this unique event. Uh, I am totally excited about this panel. Uh, we've got a bunch of individuals who are truly involved in groundbreaking efforts in the digital diplomacy and engagement space. Uh, even though it's the topic of this panel, I often recoil at the mention of words like digital engagement and e-diplomacy uh, because it's often a euphemism for a scripted Twitter account or Facebook page that's rather static. Uh, but tonight's panelists can really speak to the incredible power of technology in bolstering understanding and cooperation on challenging global problems. Uh, so let me just begin by introducing them. Uh, Jake Brewer is a managing director at change.org, wildly successful website that hosts online petitions and campaigns for organizations and causes. They had a huge impact in elevating the Bring Back Our Girls campaign into a global phenomenon, uh, generating more than a million signatures for the petition on that uh, in particular campaign. Uh, Garth Moore, a U.S. Digital Director for the One Campaign, uh, an advocacy organization that fights extreme poverty and preventable diseases, occasionally to the soundtrack of U2's latest album. Uh, Aaron Sherinian, uh, Head of Communications at the UN Foundation, which builds support for the UN and its activities, particularly related to child health, climate change, energy, technology, girls' education. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Maura Whalen, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Digital Strategy at the State Department. Her portfolio encompasses the full spectrum of state's flagship broadcast and social media tools. Uh, awesome panel, and, and Maura, I wanted to begin uh, with you because this topic is really at the forefront of news right now, especially with the ISIS hostage situation uh, involving Japanese and Jordanian uh, citizens. Uh, if you talk to any uh, military brass uh, or uh, General John Allen, the State Department's top envoy for the fight against ISIS, they're going to tell you that uh, the only way that the U.S. is going to be able to defeat ISIS is defeating the philosophy that undergirds uh, the terrorist organization. And the State Department really has a key role in that. And one of the ways that it's done it, which I think is very fascinating and very ambitious is this think again turn away uh twitter campaign uh and if you haven't seen it you should definitely check out the twitter account it's at think again underscore dos and they really do engage uh cyber jihadists on the internet uh you know in a way that has received criticism received praise for being ambitious we're one year out from that campaign beginning. I was wondering if you could just share your experience with the ups and downs of that. Sure, um, and thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for having us. I just wanna echo that. Um, it's great to be here with all of you and have the opportunity to represent all of my colleagues at the State Department. Um, to give you some context for that, there's probably about 300 people throughout the State Department with social media somewhere at the top of their responsibilities every in their everyday work. Um, of that, um, our colleagues in the Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communications, CSCC, are the ones who uh, pioneered the uh, the Think Again, Turn Away campaign. Um, it is part of, they've been in existence since I believe 2011. Um, it's part of a, a number of projects they do. This was their first effort in English. Um, the goal is essentially to have a conversation with people pushing an agenda that promotes uh, violent acts of terrorism um, and, and push back at them and, and speak in their own space. I think it speaks to um, a, a few different factors, which I'll get to, but um, as you mentioned, think again, turn away, hopefully is not aimed at anyone in this room. Um, but uh, they, they spend their time trying to go in and counter the narratives that are there. So when people say, look what the Americans did, they did this, they're pushing back and they're saying that's not true. Um, violent extremists are actually, you know, harming Muslims. They are actually, you know, defacing 
um, or, or disrespecting holidays and women and girls and you know any range of topics that might be the issue du jour in the dark parts of the internet that again, I'm guessing many of you are not participating in. Um, but um, that's, that's their goal. I think it's gotten a lot of attention because it's in English. Um, so obviously it's a lot easier, you know, it's, it, which is still um, one of the predominant languages in Twitter, so it's getting a little bit more attention. Um, but as I said, it's part of a suite of, of tools that they use. Um, why did we do this? The, the president signed the executive order, but it was basically started um, with the concept um, that extends what the State Department has done in the public diplomacy space for 50 years, which is um, we have to be where people are at. We have to engage. You can't win the war of ideas if you are not participating. Um, and I think, you know, it is groundbreaking when we talk to our allies um, and our, our friends and other governments. Um, they're looking at it closely. Their efforts tend to be more targeted on uh, preventing jihadism from taking root in their country. This is really a global effort. This recognizes the, the, tra the transnational nature of social media. Um, and, you know, we aren't saying, oh, we're only going to tweet back at people who are in the United States. We're looking at anyone who's pushing this agenda. Um, and I think that's that's notable about the way they're doing it. So we're watching it closely because it is groundbreaking. Um, and as the technology changes, the tactics will change. Um, so, um, you know, that's a little bit about that. But it is, I, I would stress, part of, a, uh, part of a whole host of activities we do um, to really be in the conversation where people are having them. Yeah, and, and it really is fascinating because you will see someone complain about Abu Ghraib or uh, Guantanamo Bay, and you'll actually see a State Department employee like engaging in the conversation. It's, it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, Jake, I wanted to ask you, uh, you guys have been involved uh, with the White House uh, it, on some of its pan petitions since you guys are kind of the experts on petitions, <laughs> and uh, I, I think this is definitely most, one of the most wild and interesting uh, campaigns the White House has done with the We the People. You know, they've had to answer questions, why doesn't the United States construct the Death Star? Uh, and one of the best answers ever, by the way. And it was one of the best answers. Uh, they've got a crack team over there. Um, but I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about your experience with petitions uh, for, for change and also working with the White House and what that was like. Sure, yeah, and the White House is really in many ways just a proxy. In fact, I think I see Macon Phillips in the back of the room there who can also speak to this uh, afterwards if everyone wants to talk to him. Um, what's interesting is that the hard part of having a conversation with the people who can make a decision is not the technology, right? That's just a facilitator of a back and forth that needs to have between citizens and the people who are making the decisions that impact those citizens. And so I think one of the, the really revolutionary, in some ways cultural shifts that we the people introduced was making the expectation in the executive branch that it was the responsibility of those people in not just the White House, but also all the federal agencies the White House has jurisdiction over, it's their responsibility to listen to what the American people are trying to say to them. And then actually creating a situation where other people can now watch online, 100,000 people or whatever the number is, mobilize and say, this is something we care about and we can engage with you directly. I think there's a lot further they can go, and in many ways, the conversations we've had, uh, Macon might be laughing in the back, um, is around wh where we think we can, they can go further, and in some cases where we think in the private sector, uh, we can make some of those decisions a little more, um, with more agility, let's say, than sometimes the federal government can, can move with. And that's that once you get the expectation of a response, that's the beginning of a back and forth, that's now a dialogue, that's actually diplomacy, that's negotiation. And so the ability of people to not just receive a response from the White House or some executive uh, authority, but then to basically re-engage and say, you know what, this response about the Death Star was great, but what about this? Um, and in some cases, a lot more serious issues, as you might imagine, than just talking about the Death Star, which, by the way, it would take eight Earths uh, worth of materials to build a Death Star. So it is impossible for <laughs> them to do that uh, as the White House has uh, responded. But, but that it's, it's as much about the cultural expectations and how we start to shift that as much as it is actually the, the idea of a petition is just a democratic act of starting a conversation with the people that you need. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, the, the technology that you use is it's nothing really groundbreaking, but the ability to count individual individuals and get that number of uh, one million people signed this, right. two million, with, has that? With it, you know, how much do you attribute that to Change.org's success and credibility? I, I mean, what we see more and more is that uh, people, when we first introduced petitions in a very scaled way, so there's now 85 million people who use their site, it's growing at 3 million users a month, 1,000 new petitions started every day, and that uh, has shifted the conversation from being, are petitions effective at all, which is what it used to be about. Now the, we actually have defamation requests that are a problem, so petitions are so effective, in fact, that people are feeling like there's too much of it uh, that they're having to respond to, which is a really fascinating shift. And I think that's really, it's, it's more about, um, as you said, the technology, in fact, is very simple. We're basically saying, you as an individual have the capacity and the right, in many ways, to tell your story. It's a lot like writing your own personal op-ed and then asking people to join you in whatever that opinion or that perspective <laughs> is. And we're just creating a platform that it's a, it's a text field, right? <laughs> a way to join and share around that. It's really about the process hacking. It's about the bureaucratic hacking. Uh, that's really where the, the killer sauce is. Mm -hmm. uh, Aaron, uh, it is easy to forget that some of the digital diplomacy that happens actually has nothing to do with governments, and it is people to people uh, connecting with each other through technology. From your perch at the UN Foundation, you've been able to see some of that. I wonder if you could just share what you've seen. Thank you, and I have to use my bonus head line. Thank you, Mr. Master, <laughs> for having us through the embassy. I think that Jake and Moira already have alluded to it, it's not all about, in this participatory age, engagement, whatever buzzword or word you're going to use, it's not always going through an institution. Now, I have the UN Foundation, I have in the name of, of, of the organization that I represent tonight, a, an important institution. But we love to connect people and ideas around issues that the UN works on. It's part of the UN's to-do list. And a big part of that is just connecting people that care about them. So I think that what we're seeing is the evolution of this new this new constituency. A lot of times we're talking about people who engage with a government or with an institution, but there's the emergence of uh, what some call the social good community. Uh, is it the social activist community? Is it the, is, is it the movement? There are people who identify themselves as engaged. They are entrepreneurial. Sometimes they're social entrepreneurs. Sometimes they're just people who identify themselves as enlightened citizens. Sometimes they just happen to be people who see themselves as people and they love to tweet or post, but we're seeing these, these engagements happen between communities, and I think that's really useful. For example, I think we saw that take place around the Climate Change Summit last year. You had a lot of people talking to each other between continents, between communities, learning from one another, and they weren't necessarily talking through Foggy Bottom or through the UN. They were talking about issues that really mattered, but they weren't necessarily talking to institutions to get that done. So I think it's a really, um, um, it's a really important thing to remember that today we've got the chance to help people share, and also it's emboldening for them. One example is I love watching a, uh, a woman who is in Nigeria, her name's Esther Akbarakwe, and she brought together a group of people in Nigeria to talk about climate change. And to see the emboldening factor that that movement has had to get people to talk to one another across continents shows that the participatory age doesn't need an institution to make things happen and make those conversations take place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Garth, I wanted to go to you because uh, at the <laughs> One Campaign, you kind of have a massive social media platform at your fingertips uh, <laughs> in the way that you, uh, you know, send things out to people who are following you guys, mm -hmm. whether it's Twitter or Facebook. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously a lot of people have, uh, you know, there's been a lot of examples of uh, large bureaucratic organizations trying to use uh, social media in, in messing up sometimes. Uh, in the past, uh, the State Department's IIP has got slammed for spending $630,000 on Facebook likes uh, to little effect in an IG report. Uh, but, you know, these, these things can happen and this is a learning process. Uh, for you, and, and you've been able to have a lot of experience with digital properties, whether it be Facebook or Twitter, but what are some of the best ways to ensure effectiveness in communication? Um, well, and, and to that example, and actually it was something that we discussed, um, the example was you can't buy Facebook likes. What this means is you can't go and you, or you shouldn't go and, you know, 
basically use advertising to try to get people to like you on Facebook because it's just buying empty seats and you're not going to get any engagement from that. Um, at one, we actually do that as part of a, a larger strategic method of trying to get people from Facebook over to our website to take action with us and to engage with us. So we put money into likes and we actually grew our Facebook page. And what that has done and what we've seen it do now is we have a larger pool of constituents there who we can convert over to taking action. And those conversions may take several posts, they may take several days, several weeks, but eventually you're gonna find the right emotional resonance, the right campaign, the right message, the right hook that's going to turn on the activist in them when they're seeing your post and they're going to engage with you. And that engagement may start with they like a comment that or a photo or a video that you post on Facebook. Then they might comment, then they might share it to their friends. And eventually there's gonna be a link in there to an action that they're gonna click over and take. So, you know, putting money into advertising behind Twitter, behind Facebook, behind some of these social realms to try to up your engagement, it's not cheating. It's actually the way things are going for a lot of organizations. And you'd be remiss if you didn't investigate different ways and methods in order to increase your volume because as you it's like anything if you increase your customer pool you're going to have more chances for success for any of the campaigns that you're running because more people are going to see this message and eventually you're going to get the right campaign um, for example this last november um, when ebola was really breaking out in uh, three of the uh, uh, countries in africa uh, we went on the offensive to talk to the un to talk to the white house to talk to different governments about um, they needed to uh, make sure that there was the right funding in place to battle Ebola so that these countries that were being stricken had the right resources and the monetary funds to fight this disease. And it took off like a shot. And that was actually a year of procurement of growing our Facebook channel, growing our Twitter channel, talking about global health, showing great stories, successful stories, heartbreaking stories, getting people emotionally involved, that when that first tweet went out, we actually filmed uh, Idris Elba on stage at the Mashable conference uh, with his message to the world about why they needed to fund Ebola. I mean, that video took off. We got 90,000 views on Twitter Native alone in the first 48 hours. So it just took off like a shot. And it's the kind of thing that procurement is an ongoing process, and it's, it's great to keep growing that base and keep getting the dimensionality of that base so that any one of your actions or campaigns at any point can work for you. Mm. Well, so I hope you all have questions for our panelists because they think they can be an amazing resource on these topics. Uh, I want to ask more one quick one uh, before we open up to the audience. Uh, you know, another issue that is obviously dominating the news is uh, the Ukraine crisis, uh, also known as the invasion of Ukraine. And you've seen, you know, East and West kind of get embroiled in a propaganda war where uh, the Kremlin and its uh, media-backed entities are trying to shape uh, the uh, the information that is available to individuals on the ground and shape the narrative while the United States is uh, uh, you know, earmarking and uh, mandating new funds for Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, uh, for its Russian language broadcasting uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, there's also been interesting individual cases of uh, diplomacy, and that's with uh, the former ambassador to Russia, uh, Mike McFall, uh, who was a very active Twitter user uh, who engaged uh, with Russian citizens in Russian. Uh, and, you know, during a time of complete uh, tumult between the two nations, uh, received a lot of flack both online and in person when, when he was in Moscow. Uh, I wonder if you could share a little bit about his experience and how you look at it, given that his tenure there is over and you might be a little bit more free to share uh, some of the details, the good and bad. Uh, for well, I, a lot of my colleagues are in the room, so everyone has to catch them after this uh, over a glass of wine to ask, ask these stories because, you some know, yes, exactly. It, it's worth me down embassy, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, watch this space because it will grow. Um, but as you pointed to, um, Ambassador McFall um, came into his position already a very credible voice on the issues um, in uh, in Russia, and you know, and, and that and he had been speaking to them for a long time. Uh, in Russia and in the United States, um, and I mention that because one of the that we spend a lot of time on is authenticity and um, and 
really a genuine knowledge of this. Instead of just using it as a microphone to really have a discussion, you have to be a credible voice. Um, and he certainly was. <laughs> Um, what we then said some criticism. We, we at the State Department backed him completely. Um, he is the person who is confirmed for the position and, and he uh, is the leading expert on, or was at the time the leading expert on Russia that we had in Moscow. So uh, we continue to, uh, to back him much as we do um, Ambassador Pyatt in, in uh, uh, Ukraine now, who if you're not following him, you really should be. Um, but. Uh, what we've seen in that space, and one of the things we fight for, is we're often in a position of trying to get out the real information. And I think all of my colleagues up here on the panel are facing the same uh, task and trying to fight through uh, the, the, the cacophony that is out there um, to present real facts and give people real actions they can take. Um, I think what we see in the case of Russia is an added case that we're actually fighting against a pop propaganda machine. Um, and what we're presenting is real and open information. And we're walking the walk by presenting uh, a democratic system to the world that engages, that exchanges ideas is that sometimes fights about the best direction for their policy, but we do it in a very open way. <laughs> Uh, what we saw in the case of Ukraine um, was we shared that value with a lot of other countries. And one of my colleagues and I uh, were able to participate in an event. Um, actually, uh, Italy was, it was where did you go? Where did Andres go? He, well, uh, there you are. You're in the back. Um, we, were, we went over to snowy Sweden uh, a few years ago, two years ago? January 2014, a year ago. Um, and um, a group of us from like-minded governments um, were there just to exchange ideas and look for ways and build the marshmallow thing that you see on. We we did that too, but um, from time. that from that came a um, a coalition, a, just a loose coalition. Um, my colleague Graham, who's in uh, the audience, you know, when we as part of a team that was happening at the State Department, coming together from different parts of the office that Macon was instrumental in putting together, um, called upon that group of folks to come up with the idea for the uh, the Ukraine hashtag that many of you saw. Um, we really felt like that was really the first pronunciation of watching not just an issue come to light, but also this concept that we're gonna we're gonna fight for these rights of people to have this conversation and this dialogue, and those of us who share that that idea are going to push it together. Um, We've built upon that in a lot of different ways. We continue to build upon it in other issues like free and open internet, and um, I'm sure many more, Ebola. Um, but um, what, what we, so I think what I'm trying to get at is you have this issue not just of the fighting for ideas, but you have propaganda. And we feel like we're on the upper hand. We have the upper hand because we have the democracy of ideas. I mean, it's, it's somewhat ironic to, watch these entities use the free and fair exchange of ideas, try to shut down uh, exchange of ideas and shut down dialogue and um, use them as tools to keep people from talking and keep people from having a voice. Um, and so, you know, we're, we've got that on our side. We're working with our colleagues to do it, but uh, um, watch this space because uh, I know there's a lot of other efforts um, we, to, amp up what we've done. Um, we do have 50 years of experience in this space of having ambassadors go into uh, rooms that may not necessarily be the most friendly, but they keep going uh, because it's important that the United States participate in that conversation and it's important that we encourage the dialogue. To us, it's walking the walk. Yeah, so. no, I mean, and just a follow up to that because you guys have also been getting increasingly creative, especially when it comes to the Ukraine crisis. Uh, and I, I wonder, I feel like that poses opportunities and risks at the same time. The uh, What I thought was brilliant was the BuzzFeed style listicle that you guys came out with. I think it was top 10 Kremlin lies. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, it, you know, one can, one can debate, you know, whether or not that was 
propaganda or not, or just truth telling, uh, but it was an effective way of communicating the message. Uh, at the same time, I feel like when the State Department reaches out and does these types of things for its create for, for critics in the United States, uh, it's things like, oh, you know, this is hashtag diplomacy. Uh, you're not going to you know defeat the Russians with a hashtag or a tweet. Uh, so I wonder how you try to balance those things because they can be having a, a less uh, sanctimonious, you know, uh, dry voice can make you really effectively communicate to a lot relevant. of people and relevant, yeah. <laughs> but it can also subject you to a lot of criticisms at home and abroad. Well, I mean, you know, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone at the State Department that we're not going to defeat anyone uh, with a hashtag. Um, that the, the, the value of all of these programs, including um, anything that you would label hashtag diplomacy or anything else is that it's backed up by policy. And in this case, the president was very outspoken. The secretary is very outspoken about our position in, in Ukraine and uh, with regard to Russia. Um, our, our leadership from Victoria Newland to Ambassador Pyatt have been very outspoken. And um, our social media presence reflected that opinion. Um, and we'll continue to do that. Um, we did have a case, I think that was very interesting. Uh, Jen Saki, who's our spokesperson, many of you know, did a Twitter Q&A uh, recently and was just taking a general questions and that sort of thing um, and was trolled by some folks um, along these lines, you know, with the subject matter of Ukraine and Russia. And, you know, because it was a troll question, didn't answer the question on Twitter Q&A, but answered, I think, 15 other questions. Um, the article that appeared on Russia Today was that she had refused to answer any questions. And so I think, you know, and it's because, you know, we were taking questions from genuine people, not from, you know, robots, um, you know, emailing or, you know, tweeting at, at us. Um, I think that speaks to the challenges that technology and, you know, as we we see this convergence of diplomacy and technology, but I, uh, one of the things we all feel on this panel, I. I feel like is that at the other end of the social media, there's the expectation of action um, that we're trying to either facilitate or answer or respect and, and hear and exchange <laughs> ideas on. And um, that that concept is what's going to rise and, and, you know, win the day um, in the case of Russia, in the case of ISIL, you know, the exchange of ideas and this expectation that we'll use these mechanisms to create action. Um, is what's going to make the difference. Yeah. Well, if we could start by taking some questions, uh, and we can also take some over Twitter as well. Um, does anyone have any questions for our panelists? Uh, all right. Oh, yes, sir. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, in some of your efforts, have you had decision making online by people getting together and having meetings online? and having transparency. Is that directed to the, the State Department? Or? Um, well, I mean, we use technology, obviously, to have conversations every day um, through, uh, through teleconference and that sort of thing. Um, I don't believe we have ever, beyond still images and that sort of thing, um, put those conversations, um, it made them publicly available. I wouldn't say um, that it's outside the realm of possibility. What we have done is um, some really interesting things on, you know, these are the, the real work of diplomacy is sometimes the, the not these top issues, but things like um, the Google Plus Hangout we did to help people facilitate travel to the Olympics. And, you know, taking a consular officer who is a former Olympian along with the consular person who is in uh, our embassy in Russia and, you know, getting them online with a journalist to ask the question and making that open and public where people can come and find out that information. Those sorts of things, you know, we do them. We have, you know, a good, a good audience and then you see it sort of take off from there and go viral um, as people, you know, tap into it after the fact to learn about this information. You know, we saw the same thing on uh, when the LGBT uh, Right, partnership rights and in, in getting visas and that sort of thing changed. Um, that's still one of our top viewed Google Plus Hangouts. 
Um, so, I, I mean, we're trying to make it more conversational and trying to open up those those methods of communication a little bit more on an active basis. Did you, yeah, could I add, and I think, maybe it's not about meetings per se, but I think summetry has changed. And I think mm -hmm. we're seeing because of the, the new reality of digital diplomacy, summits are totally different. They'll never be the same again. It's true. Uh, in fact, we are gearing up in September for a big summit where the world is essentially redeciding the to-do list. So in this audience, everyone knows what an MDG is, mm -hmm. right? Outside of Massachusetts Avenue, I don't know how many people know what the development <laughs> goal is. But this year, the new list is coming out. It's been part of a process that included a huge digital component. The world's new set of world goals, the new sustainable development goals, are part of a uh, process including my world, where seven million people voted online a digital platform so you could see in advance of what the Open Working Group and what the UN is working on will come in and what member states will vote on and activate in September. So whether or not you believe that was a meeting, all of that traffic, all of that discussion, all that conversation is now out there so that member states, whether it be from this fine nation, the United States of America, whatever, you know, whatever country we're talking about, those delegates and those heads of government are going to go to the UN with that social media traffic behind them. And it's going to either embolden them, it's going to give them uh, greater insight into their people, or in some cases, I have a feeling people are going to say, wait a minute, I saw what the world voted on. Why are you there representing a different point? So I think summetry has changed, and that hashtag, I think, has changed. You know, I remember as a diplomat, I was in the State Department for a long time. I hope this doesn't give me in trouble, but I think at the end of cables, they used to end with some hashtags. Is that right? Would someone who's a State Department person here confirm or deny this? They used to old school cables, right? Used to end with hashtags, pound, pound, pound. Mm -hmm. I think it's fascinating that now when we say pound, we're not trying to control what we're saying. Now it starts. And let's see what they do with it. And I think in the case of summetry, I don't think it's hashtag diplomacy. I think when people say that and they're pejorative, I think a lot of times they're trying to be the smartest person in the room. I think the hashtag diplomacy actually means we're, we're seeing what people want in advance of a summit. Do you want to weigh in on that? Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. I think um, things are, are having to be more open now. I think that we're having to have these conversations. And I think, you know, this is being live streamed this evening. And I think most of the summits now recognize the opportunity around the world uh, to broadcast what they're talking about. There are some meetings that go on behind closed doors before those summits and before some of those meetings. But they're airing a lot more business out there. And as activists, what we're trying to do is it, everything from Davos last week to what's coming up this September is we're trying to engage populace uh, to be part of that, to be part of those pre-conversations by petitioning their governments, by talking with their governance, governments, being part of those days themselves and really involving themselves with all the digital realms that those places uh, are having and that those meetings are taking part in. Um, it's, it's a whole new level of participation that you've never had before and we're having it as a global conversation. Um, and where we go from here, uh, I, I believe it gets more transparent and it gets more participatory. I don't see it recessing anytime soon. Yeah, just to, to kind of double or triple down, I suppose, I, I mean, I do think <laughs> no one believes that a mobilized group of people are really going to matter and actually change something and win until they do. <laughs> and then they do. And they ha it happens actually over and over and over. In fact, on our platform, there's about 5,000 times in 2014 that an organized group of people via petition won something. Sometimes a really, really big thing, some you know, big things that are in the news in every country, and sometimes it's quite small things. But at the end of the day, a hashtag is a mobilized group of people that are forcing a conversation and we're all talking about it. I mean, imagine, imagine 10 years ago trying to explain to your staff that you'd be talking about a hashtag on Twitter or on any platform. It's one of the most ingenious mobilizing tools of the last hundred years. And here we are, it is actually impacting all of our diplomacy. And that's a really, that is where the conversation is happening. It's just not in as organized a way as we might have liked it a couple years ago. Do we have any more questions? <coughs> and Raphael, you can introduce yourself too, please. Hi, my name is uh, Raphael Shepard. I'm a consultant in <coughs> governance at the World Bank. And um, especially with regards to your point about symmetry, but I'd like to hear what the other members of the panel have to say about this. Um, how do you deal with the issue of inclusiveness when you're, you, you know, when we're talking about digital dip diplomacy, not everyone has access to Twitter. And so in countries where you have low internet penetration and so <coughs> on, how do you, how do you complement your uh, digital uh, engagements with 
offline approaches. Do you want to take that first one? Yeah, this is a good opportunity. And again, grab Macon on this one and Tom uh, afterwards to really pitch uh, the great work the State Department did on YALI um, and now the Mandela Fellows. Um, so for those of you who don't know, this is something that President Obama started where he invited young African leaders to come to the United States. Um, it's in its third year, fourth year. And uh, so they put out the, the ask to our embassies. They sort of do the nominating and, and facilitate the process to identify these folks to come to the United States um, and have the opportunity to work with American leaders, uh, thought leaders, and also to meet with the president um, for a short period of time. Um, last year, in advance of the President's Africa Summit, where he had 52 African leaders in here, uh, we, we did the whole application process and building into that, the solicitation went out and for the 500 spots, there were 50,000 applicants. And from there, it became the question, not how are we going to create this event for 500 applicants, but how are we going to keep the other 50,000? engaged? How are we going to keep working with them? How are we going to make sure our embassies are equipped and know how to answer that exact question? Um, I think it speaks to, and you're, you see a lot of those tactics sort of coming up uh, with the secretary doing a Twitter Q&A, Macon's done his own Twitter Q&A, um, and trying to keep them engaged. Um, sometimes bandwidth is an issue, sometimes it's not. Um, it varies uh, in terms of, you know, ways to reach people. Um, so I think a couple of principles have become real for us. One is it's not one size fits all. We should do it on broadcast. We should do it on Twitter. We should do it on Facebook and we should do it in person. Um, and the other is that these tools, be they uh, engagement tools, like just generally speaking of, of fostering new leadership or, you know, in the case of MOOCs, which we're also involved in, um, they're making it a tangible, something people can touch, an event they can come to, uh, a place they can gather in person, and turning it into an in-person makes that network all the stronger. And it doesn't have to be for a long period of time, but knowing they can actually see another person who is engaged on that hashtag or on that topic um, has really become a hallmark of, of what we try to do when we're crafting these strategies um, to keep people engaged. And, and to that point, a little bit about technology, uh, specifically in Africa, uh, one has an office in Johannesburg. We have a big presence on the continent. We're a very popular brand on the continent. Um, last year, when they first started talking about what are now called the SDGs, which is the worst name ever, Sustainable Development Goals, we really need to all pick another, another name for that. Um, tonight, well, please tonight, those out. if anybody has <laughs> the world goals, what are SDGs? That just sounds terrible. Um, last year, we engaged a lot of our African populace in a campaign we called You Choose which is these goals are coming up and these goals have not really been written by all of society, especially by a lot of people in developing nations. So what we did was we went out to a lot of networks that at the time weren't really a presence in Africa. They're growing now. Twitter is growing in Africa. Facebook is growing in Africa. But at that time, there were a lot of other channels like Mixit and a lot of other social channels that we went to. We also went to radio and we also went to SMS. Mm -hmm. So we built SMS tools. And I mean, you know, this is growing in Africa, the smartphone. Now they're carrying two phones. They're carrying their flip phone to do all their calls and keep their minutes on. They're doing smartphones to work and play and, and, and engage a little bit more. So what we did was we engaged a lot of folks through SMS. Uh, we engaged a lot of folks through other social channels to do things like signing petitions to adding their comments. Uh, the radio stations also were really good about that. And then we did an agriculture campaign this last year where we put a number of African artists together and they recorded a song. And you could get the song as a free download onto your phone or down onto your computer by texting into the radio station. And one ate the minutes. We bought all the minutes. So we made sure that because minutes are like gold in Africa, you want to keep as many minutes as possible. We made sure that nobody spent any of their hard earned minutes working with us on our advocacy. So they signed petitions, they got a free download, and we had two million petition signers to our Do a Great Petition. It's a, one of the largest petitions that we've ever done in any country in one's history. And handing that in felt very good, and knowing that, to Mara's point, it was 
social. It was uh, social channels that we hadn't thought of. It was SMS. It was mobile. It was a lot of media partners working within different realms. And it's not a one size fits all. You really have to diversify channels in order to try to reach a lot of different populaces that you're not going to always get through a hashtag or through Facebook. John, can I, can I tell a story that tells, tells, I think, that train? And we all have them, right? Everyone here in this room probably has these stories, but I'll never forget last year at Davos, in advance of Davos, in fact, uh, colleagues here in the room uh, helped work on this particular initiative, but through the Plus Social Good Network, which is a partnership that we work on with UNDP and with Mashable and with the 92nd Street Y uh, and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, among others, uh, we hosted a conversation so that we could say to the world, what do you think they should be talking in Davos that they're not? What should be that subject matter that they raise at Davos? And lo and behold, because of a Twitter chat, I'm, I'm making some of this wrong, <coughs> but because of a Twitter chat that was going on, maybe it was even a Twitter chat on the margins of a G Plus hangout, there was a radio show in Africa that picked up some of the conversation that some farmers on the, you know, in the region of Kilimanjaro, the way that the story is now told, they were on the, you know, the slopes of Kilimanjaro, as it were, on the, uh, on the mountainside, as it were, that they reacted to via tweet that got back to someone who was picking it up and put it back into the conversation. So that at a certain point we could say, this is not conjecture, this is not old information. Some farmers on Kilimanjaro were talking about the importance of, of agroeconomics and some of the issues we want you to talk about, and we want you to take that with you to Davos. I love that story because it was radio, SMS, all of those things. That's possible today, it's not perfect. Everyone talks about the power of the feature phone and, and, and we wanna make sure we don't ignore it. But that chain is possible today, and I think the smartest leaders will engage with it and they'll mm -hmm. find out what those people were saying because they actually have the ability. Yeah, I wanna make sure we get all the questions in. Uh, sir, with the tan sweater, you <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hi, Jeff. I'm from. Uh, Jeff Hahn, I'm from RCR Wireless News. Um, I just had a quick question for you. Uh, I guess this is for the panel. Uh, you've talked a lot about the positive effects of greater communication and um, internet penetration and the ability of people to communicate. To, but um, is there also the fact that the more and more information that's put out there, it's easier for people to pick and choose what information fits their preconceived notions also? Um, oh, okay, now it's on. Um, which fits their preconceived notions to the detriment of the whole. Um, I guess the most uh, stunning example I, is um, the recent measles outbreak in the United States or the uh, upswing in polio throughout Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, uh, Pakistan, mostly due to rumors spread through the internet and smartphones that to either vaccinations will cause autisms or in the case of Sub-Saharan Africa and Pakistan, polio vaccine is a plot by the United States to sterilize people. So um, how do you counteract that? And it, do you feel that this is gonna be an, an increased problem as greater penetration takes off? That's a really good question. Uh, I'm, I'm just seeing a lot of content. We, we deal with a lot of content and there's a lot of different ways that that manifests. Um, and so the short answer is yes. Actually, one of the best books on this topic is uh, by Eli Pariser in a book called The Filter Bubble, mm -hmm. um, which is essentially, it's, it's actually not just the content that's created, it's also in this case, uh, or sorry, in the age that we live in, the algorithms that drive a lot of the tools that we use actually go out of their way to give you more of what you already want. <laughs> so it, it's uh, your attention is easier to, um, what's the best way to say this? If your attention is a little bit like candy <laughs> and healthy information is a little bit like vegetables, uh, the algorithms try to give you more candy when you probably need to be eating more vegetables, right? This is kind of something we would all generally agree with. It's my silly analogy for the evening, I promise that's the only one. Um, but how we as, as companies or as platforms, as people who actually run these systems take responsibility for that is a question. I'll say right now, I don't know a single one that's got to figure it out. And I think it's a conversation that needs to be driven. It's, it's a conversation I know that's happening at Twitter, I know it's happening at Facebook, um, and the policy teams who are writing this. If you think about Facebook as an example, they have 1.3 billion active users, monthly active users. If it was a country, it would be as big as China or India. Um, we have 85 million, we're actually about the same size as Italy. Uh, and, and you think about the people who are writing the policies that undergird and how those, those sites actually work, it's a little bit like writing policy for a country, right? The people kind of come to your country and they visit for a little while and they have rules about how they do that. So what content you allow them to publish, what also you give them proactively is a choice that your, your platform has to make. Uh, and, and we have a long way to go to get that right. So it's, it's, I think, incumbent on anybody in this room and anybody that you work with to pressure um, all the digital kind of technology developers 
to really make that a priority and something we're thinking about. And then educating people to have healthy, what you might call information diets. Yeah, I mean, the issue of information saturation is such a good one. And uh, when there are so many opportunities uh, of, of places to get your information, uh, it's an increasingly difficult job of, of communicating really urgent information. I wonder if you have uh, some insight. On well, that. I was going to say the the other thing I would add on to that is just empowering people <clears throat> within the organization to speak. And you know, you take a big organization like the State Department, and you know, we have giant clearance processes, and you know, diplomacy doesn't always move at the speed uh, uh, the, the consumer would like it to move at um, on when or it comes to social media, <laughs> right? So, but you know, empowering those who are given the microphone, our ambassadors, our people in the field, to you know, they don't have to wait for for guidance back in Washington to say it's not true. A measles outbreak was not, or polio outbreak was not caused by the United States, like. They can. They should be empowered to to take that one on, um, and and to have the conversation. Um, and I think that culture change is one that we've seen happen rapidly at the State Department. But we're pretty much there. You know, our folks are jumping online. They they have their own Twitter feeds. You know, they're not clearing every last one. We empower them the same way we do to come and sit before a group and and talk. Um, you know, we say you know you're, you're a trusted voice of this institution, and you should use that voice. Um, that's going to be a game changer. I think the technology has forced us, you know, a 24 hour news cycle, a technology that's constantly asking questions has forced us to look at ourselves. And um, I think now we've created a situation where that's an expectation of, of policymakers um, and making their job a little harder, but it's the way that we're doing things these days. Just a quick yeah. shout out real quick. Actually, in, in the kind of the vein of like looking for information that you probably wouldn't otherwise find, but it's really important. Um, I don't think he's here, but Andy Carvin uh, is doing some of the most interesting work. He was at NPR for a long time and has just started a, a startup called Reportedly. And they're essentially using the, the tools available to go and look for the stories of the individuals on the ground being directly affected by a lot of the issues mm -hmm. that we would all be talking about and addressing. Um, and just like the, more of that, I think, is also one of the ways that I think we can be fostering and developing better conversations in kind of a healthier way. Mm -hmm. Did you guys want to weigh in? You know, the, because you threw it out there, you threw out the vaccines issue. And I would just say, to, to, to your point, Maura, that you, know, you have to empower people. Is it government institutions that are countering the misinformation about vaccines? It's, I happen to know, over 260,000, many of them moms, yeah. online who have said to people, yep. let me give you the vaccines work information. If you want to talk about a hashtag community mm -hmm. between vaccines work and the Shot at Life campaign and the number of people who are saying, I have the information. I feel empowered and ready to back up the stuff that I happen to know the UN, WHO, you know, USAID, any other programs they're working on so that I can back that up. That's where it's smart engagement because yeah. you're empowering not just the people who work for the State Department who have a state.gov email, but the people who actually are issue ambassadors and champions. So I would follow, I think it's a fascinating thing to what, whatever you believe about the issue, follow how moms in this country are counteracting information that's out there after the discussions about Disneyland started. It's a fascinating mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, Shot at Life, I think, is one of the better online campaigns I've ever seen in terms of taking a group of people around an issue and just empowering them to speak for your issue. I mean, these are, you, you cannot tell a mom blogger what to say. That's just wrong. They will say what they're going to say, but when you empower them with the right information, they're bulldogs and they will take your issue to town. It is an ab absolute force. Um, and, and to that, I think part of your brand or part of what you do, whether it's a State Department brand, UN brand, change brand, whatever, is you have to be trustworthy to mm -hmm. back up your information and to go against a lot of the misinformation that's out there. That's in how you communicate every day. That's how you communicate with your uh, social audiences. Uh, that's how you get those tete on tete conversations so that when something like this comes up, when there's a campaign moment, when there's a, an issue moment, when there's a news moment, you have those advocates. They trust you. They've been in a conversation with you. They'll work with you in order to get that message out there. If your brand is trustworthy and your audiences feel like they're trustworthy, they will fight with you. And that's the best way to do it. And that will counter any misinformation out there. Another way to be trustworthy is probably not having an intelligence service that runs a phony vaccination campaign, uh, which is, of course, not a State Department uh, operation, but uh, I, I just had to throw that in there. We've got a question back here. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm Omid, uh, political presenter 
for uh, Afghan TV channel, but I'm asking a question on behalf of Go Global Media. If you could Here, speak up, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, just as as we all well, as we are well aware that the youth mission in Afghanistan has completed. I mean, the combat mission. The new chapter has been opening in the youth mission in Afghanistan. Just want to know about the youth digital diplomacy in Afghanistan after this. Thank you very much. So, uh, how is digital diplomacy in Afghanistan uh, playing out as, as, as U.S. troops withdraw? Uh, do, do you have any insights into that, Lauren? Well, I mean, you know, we're in constant dialogue with the uh, with the embassies um, and and how they position. I think it does speak to to one thing, which is that we have empowered all of our embassies to have their own appropriate social media platforms um, for the country they're in. So that's not just Facebook or Twitter, but whatever wherever people are convening, they are empowered to have a presence. Um, and it is decentralized uh, because we want them to address the issues locally. So they know what's coming through. They know where to find information about what the universal policy is. And they are best equipped to position that within the local conversation. Um, and the embassy will continue to do that to the degree that they um, and in the way that they think um, it best suits their policy objectives. Um, and uh, I wouldn't expect that that would fall off. I would expect it to continue to grow as it has um, over uh, the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, any more questions uh, from the audience? I'm surprised we don't have more. Yes, right here. Uh, wait, wait till the microphone comes around. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Federica Bindi. I'm at SAIS. And uh, I had a stint in diplomacy. And for me, the hardest thing was that as an academic uh, as an academic person, I was paid to say whatever I wanted. Then when I went in this post in diplomacy, ooh, oopsie, that became problematic. So I guess you have a similar problem. Because yes, on the one side, you want to communicate as much as you, want, as you can and engage. But on the other side, at least at the State Department, you do have a problem of keeping the information and only passing some and not others. How do you deal with that, especially as the younger generation of diplomats become more and more engaged? Well, it's interesting. We've, we've actually had this conversation across governments. I was actually, I mentioned Sweden before, I was talking to our Swedish colleagues not long ago about Carl Bildt, right? Like the, the digital diplomat. Um, and, you know, when he was no longer in office, what was going to happen? Um, and, and where was his voice going to go? And certainly those are conversations we're all having. Um, I think we have erred on the side of understanding that uh, we are in an age where people are viewing their individual social media accounts as an extension of who they are. Um, and uh, as an institution, we have to figure out how to embrace that because often who they are is exactly why we want them in the positions they're in. Um, and we've trusted them enough to, to you know, the, the president has nominated them, the Senate has confirmed them in the case of ambassadors or uh, some of our cabinet level officials, and we want to be able to trust those voices to speak on, our, on behalf of the United States around the world. Um, but we're still contending with, you know, what happens to the tweets and who owns the followers and, you know, all of these things. Um, and that's the more boring side of, of these jobs that we're doing in government, which are pretty cool jobs, but you can get very caught up in conversations with lawyers and, uh, and others about what we have the right to do, what we don't have the right to do, um, whose hands are on the keyboard, and is that a government dollar being spent to do that, which then can impact where those followers go. Um, and, you know, we've tried to wrap our heads around it. Um, we haven't we haven't quite gotten there, but I will say one of the things we have done is our undersecretary, uh, Rick Stengel, who came from Time Magazine, is you know, it led that transformation, uh, really understands that some of these baseline issues, which seem very mundane, will really be what make or break um, maintaining an organization that's going to be transparent, that's going to be forward-leaning. Uh, if we make it too hard for people, they're not going to do it, and we want them to do it. We want to encourage them to do it. So he's got a team that he's put together um, and is still developing, trying to really make sure we we get to these answers, or at least give people some guidelines that you know we can feel comfortable with. Um, so I, you know, if you have any good suggestions, we're we're totally open. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like it also involves maybe a change of culture at some point where we need to get more, we need to have a greater understanding that people uh, gaff and saying stupid things is actually part of being a human being. Uh, and, and to some extent that might already be happening. Uh, I think people are getting used to the idea 
that uh, if you have a, an embarrassing Facebook photo from your past, uh, that doesn't immediately disqualify you from any you know public service job ever. Um, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Do you know? Well, I'm just thinking about the visual that Moira you know helped us paint. The diplomats, I have so much respect for the U.S. diplomats that are that are around the world and diplomats of any country. You know, they raise their hand, right, and they mm -hmm. take an oath. And today, the ones that are now what in their 20s and their 30s, they're you know maybe they're taking the oath with a phone in their hand because they were we raised have, like, sworn in on an e-reader. So they were raised in this in this era, right? Divine. So they're they're raised in this era. Um, a recent study said 62% of people 18 to 44, the first thing they touch in the morning is their phone. I don't know what that says for their husband or wife you know, with them, or you know, sometimes some people it's their, you know, whatever, whatever would be their alarm clock, but that's what is in their life, right? And I think that it's amazing how we're gonna see this a new is this we're in a transition mode. I think that's your point. We're in a transition mode right now. My, the first computer that I used as a diplomat was a Wang computer with a green screen. I mean, something to But you had a here. computer. There was so. a computer, and there were people who transitioned <laughs> into that. And I think it's going to be a really interesting change. Like the change will come with a lot of things, but it's not about age. It's really, I think, about this idea that it's interesting when we're human. I love the story about the U.S. ambassador to Ecuador and his is a blues band he played in, yeah. mm -hmm. and he was it was that what it was, and he was talking about this idea on social media, and I think that was the humanization of an ambassador, and that's the flip side of the coin about we're all human <laughs> too. So, so things will be interesting about us, and there will be some things that'll be kind of different about us. Yeah, and I think that comes with a word of caution. You know, earlier they said a hashtag, a hashtag can't take down somebody, and a tweet can't take down somebody, but people can take themselves down with yeah. their own tweets. And that's and we've seen it time and time again. It's very easy to stick your own foot in your mouth and completely derail your credibility in your career. So, um, you know, with that, I think there's a certain level of responsibility you need to have in a social space. Um, I'm all for um, our CEO, uh, Michael Elliott, who's a former editor at Time Magazine, uh, is an avid tweeter. He tweets cones, and he's from England, so he tweets about tea a lot, and and football scores, and not the football we play here, but the football the rest of the world plays. And so, you know, and he's very much a human, but he's also very much a representative and a spokesperson for our organization. You know, he's talking to our board every day. He's talking to our constituents every day. He's leading our staff through this fight and talking to governments and, and whatnot. And so he recognizes that balance and that responsibility. And that really, it's not a top down thing. It's great that it's starting at the top at one. It's not a bottom up thing. It's an everybody thing. You look at organizations like Charity Water, everybody there tweets and everybody there carries their mission on everything they do every social channel they touch and that's the kind of power that you can give to your staff members and to your team members and let them be your brand ambassador while they're being their own career ambassadors and their own personal ambassadors Jake, do you want to yeah, just a, just a kind of a thought to maybe inject a little optimism and hope along this uh a couple years ago, right about the same time the Obama administration took office, I was at a place called the Sunlight Foundation. What we did was a, a lot of work around digitally kind of trying to bring the government into the 21st century. And if you look at what has happened in that amount of time, it, the, the biggest issue at that point was that the government basically wasn't allowed to use cookies to run any websites. Mm -hmm. You can't run a website in the modern internet without using cookies, right? We've, we've moved past those really super silly issues or whether Twitter is a good place for a member of Congress or a, you know, a, an ambassador to be and, and really moving into like, how do we actually use these tools effectively to engage citizens and actually solve problems? And, and we actually have made tremendous progress. And if you kind of think about where we are, as much as there's pain in some points of questioning and, and some difficulty, we've where we're going is also quite positive, I think, if you kind of look at the trajectory we're on. So it's kind of it's kind of fun and even good to, to know that these problems are like progress. Yeah, I think we had a question back here. Oh, I have oh so yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, well, thanks again for the discussion. Um, my name is Angelica. I was wondering just more generally, when do you think digital diplomacy will become mainstream and just be diplomacy um, in one of my classes at Georgetown last year in the public policy program, I did a presentation and was surprised at how few people were aware of, you know, the efforts at the State Department and, you know, other institutions and embassies. Um, and when, so the question is really, when will digital, digital diplomacy become mainstream and just be diplomacy? If, Mara, do you want to take uh, I would argue that it is. Um, and that those of us in the diplomatic circle know about it. Now, does my mom necessarily? Well, my mom hasn't 
she, she's not very digitally engaged, let's just put it that way. Um, but does she realize that it's happening there? No, but I think um, when you see the growth in our followers, when you see the growth in followers in organizations like the UN Foundation or One Campaign or Change.org, um, we know that that audience is growing, that if people are going to spend, so then the, the conversation becomes, if people are going to spend five minutes or 10 minutes of their day caring about these issues, um, how are they going to spend that time? So I think for institutions like the State Department, we're there. I think the last diplomacy report said something like 85% of foreign ministries have a presence on social media, um, that the largest followers are people, are diplomats that we do know, Barack Obama, uh, the Pope, um, and, uh, and they are engaging on global issues and offering people an opportunity to, to engage. So I guess my answer back to those folks would be, I think you are. I think if you've heard of issues like uh, shot at life, if you've heard of, of campaigns around Ebola or bring back our girls, you are participating in digital diplomacy. So that, and you're empowered to do so and we want to keep that growing. That I would differentiate, which I think is where you're going, from you know foreign ministers uh, tweeting pictures of them shaking hands with another foreign minister, um, or hashtag Davos, which you know was quite <laughs> <laughs> quite prevalent. But I think we're there. I think the institutions expect um, that we have to have a conversation in this space. In, yes, um, I mean, if we could get a microphone. Uh, my name's uh, Niall Cronin from the Embassy of Canada. Um, one thing I was really struck by is that, that sort of in digital diplomacy, often the audience is a foreign public, and there's a campaign to get a message or engage with a foreign public. Mm. But I'm finding that a lot of the followers or where the messages are also getting amplified is back home. So we have a great example from Canada. Our ambassador in Afghanistan was really active on, or is very active on social media, and especially around the time of the election. And so what she was putting out and some of the messages and the images was informing debate back in Canada around Canada's participation in Afghanistan, what our mission has contributed, and balancing some of the picture that was coming out um, in other sort of the media reports or, or other, other commentary. So I'd be interested in sort of from, from the panel hearing about are there, have there been campaigns either sort of led by State Department to influence a, a foreign public or engage with a foreign public or that have come from overseas that have changed policy minds or policymakers' minds or decisions back in the States? I can talk about one that's really interesting in Italy right now, uh, which might be appropriate. Um, there's a, there's a, man, <laughs> give me a second. Uh, an Iranian man who has been sentenced to death in Iran right now is an Italian citizen. And uh, that issue was basically not being talked about. So Hila Rabi, I believe, is the name who may be familiar to some of the uh, diplomats in the room. But um, a, a mother who had been, who's a, a Persian woman who had lived in Italy for the last 35 years, learned of this, started a petition. Now about 200,000 people in Italy are talking about this, this sentence that this man has been put to death in Iran and are now organizing to actually bring this petition and this issue to the embassy of Iran in Italy uh, to actually push that issue and really raise it to the level where the Italian government is now having to, to listen to its citizens and maybe fight for it in a way that it hasn't. And we see that type of thing happen actually pretty often um, on our platform just because it, it's kind of a, in many cases, a, a platform of last resort for people. So they, they've tried the, the quote unquote normal channels where they've called a, a member of parliament, a member of Congress, or they've tried president's or a, a prime minister's office. Um, and, in, and when they're not heard, they turn to kind of the big public megaphone. Anybody else have anything you want to share on that topic? Well, your, your question digs into an area where there are people who spend their, their days on the whole issue about the Smith-Munt Act and how the, you know, different messages are supposed to affect different audiences and what they do. It's, I think it just reveals how much this is a new language, right? It's, it's just fascinating and how much what a person is saying about a policy objective in another country is going to be consumed by everybody. So that's that's it's empowering. It's a little bit scary. It's it's emboldening. It's just it's it reinforces that we're in new frontier stuff. But the issue that I wanted to also that I heard in your question is that it means that regardless of who you're talking to, you need to make sure that your message is understandable. So mm -hmm. that there's now a, a responsibility to be understandable 360 degrees, mm -hmm. uh, not just about you know making a message smaller to fit in 140 characters, but making a message understandable 
in some ways it's still targeted, but regardless of who your target audience was, other people are going to be absorbing and consuming that information. So, go yeah, and and exactly to that point, the one campaign is a global campaign. We have one Twitter account. We have a couple of smaller ones for some language things, but mainly we have our main Twitter channel. That channel represents our staff in Johannesburg, our staff in London, our staff in Paris, in Brussels, in Berlin, and in the United States. Well, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a big day of action around Action 2015 and this big global <coughs> poverty slash climate movement that's going to be you know, marching towards the SDGs this fall. Uh, on this day of action in January 15th, we had 15-year-olds in countries all over the world meeting with representatives and leaders. And for one, that started very early in our morning in, in Tanzania and in Johannesburg. And so as those meetings were happening and we were taking photos of those kids meeting those ministers and, and doing their work there, uh, kids and our constituents in Europe were seeing those photos as they were starting into their mornings and afternoons. And as we were starting into our mornings, going to our DC meetings and our New York City meetings, our 15 year olds are looking at our tweets and looking at the 15 year olds in Africa, making a huge connection there. And the message is that they were telling uh, ministers in Africa, um, suddenly we kind of went off script in the United States and we took some of their messaging as well, knowing that who they were talking to was inspiring them. So I would completely agree with that in that, you know, you're, you may have a target audience for your message, but the whole world sees it. And especially as a trusted brand and as a trusted organization, um, you have the ability even from the smallest ranks to a global organization to influence a really huge swath of folks. Yeah. Uh, any more questions from the audience? Sure. Nothing from this side of the room. <laughs> yeah, it's unbalanced, <laughs> asymmetric. I feel I feel obligated to ask a question now that both people next to me asked one. Um, <laughs> so with the uh, with the surge in digital diplomacy, uh, there's a large amount of data being generated around very specific topics. Uh, with that data, there's a large potential for analytics. So how are organizations and governments taking that data and either uh, examining trends or forecasts in the landscape? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Internal metrics, um, how to gauge effectiveness. Uh, how, how do you know if you're doing the right thing or not? Uh, do you, get, you guys want to share your thoughts on that, Jake? Uh, yeah, we, so one interesting thing, actually kind of almost going back to a question earlier too, is when you talk about inclusiveness, there's also an element of safety. Um, that really comes into the digitalness of any kind of advocacy or diplomacy that's happening online these days. So uh, if you're challenging power, if you're talking to a decision maker at any level, um, that often means that it, in the United States, any most Western democracies, it's fine. It's actually encouraged and there's a, there's a value around that. Um, but in a lot of places in the world, that's actually a danger. Uh, and so the data that that is generated by your activity online actually can become something that is um, potentially detrimental if it gets in the hands of those governments. And so a lot of companies, uh, and us included, employ people to actually make sure that our, our security is really tight around that data. So when you talk about how our government's using it, often they want access to it, frankly. They ask us for it a lot and we tell them no. Um, and to the degree we're allowed to, um, always tell them no. And uh, you know, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Google, et cetera, they're all kind of fighting a lot of those same types of battles. In terms of the internal metrics, which I think is also a super interesting question and the responsibility around that, um, I, I think we're, we're entering a new age of ethics where we actually have to figure out what does it mean to responsibly use the data that we're seeing. So as an example, we have lots of companies and levels of government that people come to our site and then try to influence. And some are successful and some are not. And when they're successful, it actually gives us a pretty interesting picture of what we might call an influence graph in the same way that LinkedIn can, or Facebook can produce a social graph, right? You can see who all the connections are in nodes of a community and who's connected to who. And so influence becomes this potentially great offering of social good that we could be giving to other types of companies or other nonprofits and saying, this is the most uh, effective place to have a conversation about this issue because we're seeing it happen most often on our platform. But how and where we do that um, are still questions that a lot of us have to answer. So I think like, it's kind of answering with another question, but I think that's a really, it's a really curious place at the moment and one to really keep an eye on. And do you guys have much experience with uh, fraudulent petitions that could come up and they're, they're not representative of the in individual? And if so, sure. how do you deal with that? Um, well, if I tell you, then somebody would watch this and then learn how we do it and then 
they would do more fraud. So I'm not going to tell you all the ways that we do it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's actually one of the one of the biggest secrets. There are, there are actually uh, groups of people who get together very off the record from the different internet platform companies. I will say that that does happen, and talk about how to do this well. Um, certain things that come into question are like anonymity. So if you're going to start a petition about an LGBT issue in Russia, that can get you arrested. Um, and so we allow people who are Russian citizens, we have about three and a half million users in Russia. One of the most popular topics is to repeal some of the laws um, that Russia has in the books about um, your advocacy of lesbian, gay, or transgender issues. And so keeping the anonymity is like a, just a very important thing for us. Um, so we, yeah, we, <laughs> we have a lot of safeguards in place. Uh, and a lot of that is, um, oh, that's all I'll say. A lot of safeguards in place. <laughs> Everything we else think and talk secret. a lot about it. Yeah. <laughs> and that is, a, it's obviously a struggle because yeah. maintaining anonymity is a way to empower a lot of people on the internet. But of course, that makes it more difficult to kick the tires on the authenticity of the individual right. involved. And I will say, there's real quick, there's a, there is a balance, I think, which every company also deals with, which you want to make it easy. You want to kind of lubricate the systems that would allow you to have conversation with a diplomat or with you know, a member, somebody in power, but you also want to safeguard that identity to the degree that you know it's a real person and that there's always kind of a tension between those two things and how you build your technology. Mm -hmm. We had a question over here. Um, my name is Mark and I'm just an individual. Let's assume that... Just an individual. Two, uh, yeah. Just, just, let's assume that a couple of weeks ago I was able to intercept a couple of tweeters from the Swiss bankers. And all of a sudden I, yeah, all of a sudden I decide to move one million euros into Swiss francs. Obviously, two days later or an hour later, I would have 10 million euros. Would I be considered an inside trader talking about ethics? Huh. Uh, that's an interesting question. Go ahead. It sounds Jay. a little bit like blackmail as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, describe the scenario real quick again. I'm sure. Not sure that, that could be helpful. Could you, it. could you give that example one well, more time? Uh, in the in the world of hacking and whatever, you know, it could be that could be that some Swiss bankers may have tweaked someone yep. about changing, you know, letting the franc float okay. freely. Yeah. All of a sudden, if I move a million euros into Swiss francs in an hour, I will have ten million euros. That puts me. Am I an inside trader or just a lucky guy? Or uh, it's a great question. So basically, if you if you take advantage of digital information, which moves very quickly, and use that to your financial advantage, are you now an insider trader? Is that kind of Correct. the question? Yeah. Um, so great question. You might ask the folks on Wall Street who are right now uh, <laughs> trading millions of stocks in less than a millionth of a second. Uh, that's actually a whole other issue, I think. Really not for this panel, but um, <laughs> I, I think I, I, be, I do think that's a great question. How do you actually? What is the responsibility of a citizen with the with the information they get access to, um, in terms of your financial trades? I don't know. Yeah, and just do we have lawyers side. on the panel? Yeah, I was going to say as a side note, a really good site to follow is a site called Rappler.com. They're based in the Philippines. Uh, Maria Ress is the uh, founder of that. Uh, just fantastic citizen journalism, and they do a lot of what they do is a lot of black hat following on Twitter. And so um, the scariest thing that she ever showed me was a map of how terrorists talk on Twitter and how they erase their steps along the way. Truly terrifying how quickly they can disseminate information to each other and then bury it and move on. And they've actually, they've had people map it all the way from the Philippines all the way to the Middle East and how quickly that network evolved and then devolved almost quickly. One, of course, has no statement on this, but <laughs> Rappler.com is a really interesting site. Everybody yeah. should check it out. It's, the dark it's really place. informational. Yeah. And on the flip side of what she does, she also helps empower people who have information in terms of how do you grab information to deal with disaster mitigation mm -hmm. and response. Yeah. So it's, I think it's a good, it's a good example of yeah. how in delving into this, you can actually go on the other side, on the social good side, and she as a social good advisor can, can you know, tell these stories better, but how you can take that quick information, grab it. In your case, you were, you were you know, doing something illicit with, with uh, millions of francs. In her case, she's talking about getting information and helping it help millions of people in the case of a disaster. Yeah. Who determines the illicity of the transaction? Uh, I, I, again, I think that's a really good question for a lawyer. Next panel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Different. <laughs> Different 
but I, I do this idea of, of social bad is increasingly becoming an important issue, especially when you see groups like the Counter Extremism Project, uh, which is a group that it without you know there is some controversy in the sense of they tr they identify and in. in and try to name and shame individuals who are cyber jihadists, who are spreading uh, m malicious, terrible things on the internet. And what they try to do is really nag Silicon Valley uh, firms to try to censor and remove them from the internet. Uh, and it has implications for, for free speech and the, you know, Companies like Twitter and Facebook don't necessarily like to be haggled uh, to remove accounts because it makes them in a policing sort of role. Uh, I wonder, uh, more. we talked a little bit about this, and there is the idea that the, this can be uh, uh, obstructing <laughs> intelligence gathering as well because obviously a lot of these accounts are being monitored uh, a lot by intelligence agencies trying to get more information on whether these people are actually threatening or just spreading uh, ideology that we find uh, deplorable. Well, we talked about it in the context, there was a hearing about this um, a few days ago um, on the House side, the House Foreign Relations Committee. Um, I think it's important to point out that most of these platforms in terms of how we deal with them as a government and how I know other governments deal with them, um, they're willing to be partners with us, um, there we we work together. Uh, that said, they are a company and they have terms of use and they uh, stand behind those. And um, that's their that's their position as a, as in many of their cases. If it's a tech company, it's a global company. Um, and uh, so, as we all sort of move forward together on this, I think we're looking for the solutions. Um, of how we're going to address some of these larger issues. Obviously, the president has taken that on um, directly by trying to, you know, provide some legislation that begins to head us in that direction. Just the act of doing that, I think, is going to be really transformative to say we have to have a real honest conversation about where our rights begin, where our rights end, what the responsibilities are of companies, why are we sectoring off the responsibility of certain companies but not others, um, and, you know, really put that to the test. Um, and, you know, it's going to be interesting um, to see where the conversation goes because I think it's going to be different than a lot of these conversations. I think there is the expectation that it's going to be participatory, that we're going to see a lot of input from people wanting to say, what they think the role of, of the digital world should be in all areas, not just diplomacy, which we're here to talk about, but also um, in you know the privacy of our own homes and our own functions and what we do with our everyday <laughs> lives and our finances and everything, um, how that's all gonna come together. Uh, because we all do know, as you're saying, it, it, there's as much bad that can come from this as there is good. Um, but let's be honest, the things we click right through whenever we go to company, you know, go onto these sites are the things that are defining what are allowing them to do that. Um, the, the challenge on our side is there are actors out there who are spending a lot of times, a lot of time trying to get around those terms of use and really digging into them, um, using creative translations of words um, it, to say this site is bad or that site is good. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of that. And, you know, it keeps, it, it, you know, it, the to-do list becomes longer, um, but around, you know, we have to balance that bad with the good, and we're still seeing this being transformative for good really outweigh um, the negative. Yeah. I mean, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, it, it, yeah, in the back. Hi. Um, my name is Ricardo Rufo. Um, my question is, um, celebrity advocacy. You know, we've talked about artists in Africa, um, and I've seen the, uh, also on the UN side and also on uh, change.org. You might use celebrity advocates, and you know, we have examples like uh, Emma Watson, the He For She campaign, very successful. It could also very easily go the other way around. And my question is, um, how do you go about selecting like, how does it happen? Do celebrities come to you with their interests? Do you use, like, consultants? Like, you know, there are advocacy consultants, <laughs> philanthropy consultants, or do you have in-house ways to choose them? 
Yeah, I mean, this is a great question. Uh, I think you have some experience with celebrity activism in your organization. So yeah, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I, I work for Bono. I don't speak for him, and he does not have a Twitter account. So, I, uh, yeah, he won't be following this conversation. Um, celebrity uh, activism um, is just another influencer channel. Mm -hmm. It's just as good as somebody with an 80 clout score who has a fantastic blog who is tweeting and talking to the community every day. It's gonna get people who feel marginalized or who like this person and may not know about an issue and get them engaged some way. Will there be backlash? Of course there will. There are people who watch the Academy Awards just to yell at people on the red carpet and think that they look like idiots. At the same time, there are people who tune into that same show and love what these people are doing. So um, we have a healthy balance. We don't rely too heavily on our celebrities. Uh, we do have people in-house who work with Bono's team, who work with other celebrities, especially when they feel uh, compelled about an issue. The actor Idris Elba, who was in a Mandela film and also in Luther, uh, felt very strongly about our Ebola campaign, and he actually came to us to want to work on it. Um, he has ties you know, back to Africa, and he really wanted to work on this issue. Um, but we just don't rely solely on celebrities, and I don't think any organization should. Um, you should really rely on your influencers, and those can be people living in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and those can be people living on the mansion on the hill. Just getting everybody involved with the conversation and getting their networks to talk about it is the most important tactic. Right. So you, you're you scratching on also, I think, a really important issue right now because celebrity advocacy is not new. That's nothing mm -hmm. that's happening in the digital era, right? It's, it's made their new tactics that are happening. The best advocates for anything are the people who are real, who really care about mm -hmm. the issue, and I think what's happening in the digital age is just in a faster way, in a much more public way, you can tell who's really into it. And so we, at the UN Foundation, for example, we love working with some very generous people. These are busy people and they're people, right? They've got lives and families and things going on. And they've decided to dedicate one of their assets, which in some case may be a kick in Twitter account or a very big social media presence to an issue. And you can really tell when they care. So I think it just may, it ups the ante on celebrity advocacy when you use them because of the way that the, the, the digital um, universe works. And for those who want to criticize it, as a communicator, as a PR person, I always think, yeah, heaven forbid you found someone with huge reach to connect with someone. And a lot of people like to, 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 to take some of those elements down because when it's not authentic, it, it can be a problem. But if you were in the room when my daughter saw Malala on Skype, and how that changed her life. My daughter will be an advocate for girls and women for the rest of her life because of that connection. That's what she connected with. And so I think you can't choose for people whom they connect with, but wow, if you really leverage a celebrity in an authentic way, and when they really like Pharrell, Pharrell on the International Day of Happiness was using his own voice and reaching out to people. And those were the magic moments. You know, not just the pre-scripted moments or not the moments that your agent takes care of, but it gives them that voice and that ability to interact, uh, you know, one to one, and that's and that's powerful. Yeah. Did you guys want to add anything? Just just quickly, we're in a weird spot of um, seeing because of growth. We we did not see this about a year and a half ago, but we now see what you might call organic celebrity engagement. Like we don't we don't try for it. We don't actually ask for it. It's just kind of of their own volition. And what's so interesting is it's ne it's almost never to start a petition. What they're doing is they're taking a story that would almost never otherwise be heard and they're just amplifying it. If amplification is one of the critical components to moving a story from, from just being there to actually getting towards a decision being made in a sol solution oriented way, that's a really big piece and they're just organically finding these petitions and then working with the petition starters often to just get attention to that issue. Uh, and it's really a beautiful thing to watch because as uh, they were saying, it, it's because they care, they very genuinely care, and so they're tweeting about it, or they're, uh, in some cases, Russell Brand actually just a couple weeks ago in the UK actually went with a petition starter, organized a protest down the street, like actually took a box and took the petitions and walked down the street to do a petition delivery all on his own. We didn't know it was gonna happen beforehand. It was really a beautiful thing to watch, and that I think is happening more and more. It's pretty cool. I would, I would say, uh, the I think the authenticity is a big thing. For us, the other transformative thing is being able to bring in that audience to, for us, the State Department, right? So you take an issue like the Secretary 
um, has long been committed to oceans. Anyone in the diplomatic circles know John Kerry, knows John Kerry has cared about this issue for a really long time. He had a big summit. We brought in, you know, former uh, heads of state. We brought in a lot of advocates. We brought in some people who followed us on Twitter. But we also had Leonardo DiCaprio come and commit resources. And of course, you know, naturally. It spiked in our traffic. We got tons of new followers, all of this sort of thing. But more importantly, it brought people who didn't necessarily see diplomacy as part of the ocean's challenge into the conversation. And now they know that. And now they're following us. So the, the gain there is actually a policy gain um, by broadening that and saying, guys, you can't just say, I care about oceans, but I don't care about that diplomacy stuff. <laughs> they Everything goes hand in hand, I think, in this space. Yeah. Well, I really want to thank the Italian Embassy for hosting this. Uh, Andres Sandre uh, helps with this video. He also has a new book on digital diplomacy that you can pre order on Amazon. All digital diplomacy, so check it out. And thanks for coming. Thanks to John for moderating this and to our panelists. Pizza and Italian beer are waiting for you in the hall. <laughs> I hope the reception can be as participatory as the tonight conversation. Thank Thanks. Okay.